Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Iyer. Welcome to a special edition on China. We have our expert Sridhar Chityala ji and uh, Sridhar ji, namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar and good morning. Good morning uh, here in uh, New York and good morning in California and good evening and late good evening in uh, in India. Yes, sir. And uh, those of uh, you who are joining us from Gyan Ganga, a warm welcome to you. This is a bigger picture uh, interpretation of what China has been doing for the last 70 plus years. The title is The Rise and Rise and Rise of China. And we are going to go into some topics that perhaps you may have not encountered in any other television program or on a YouTube broadcast. Um, Sridhar Chityala ji is an expert. He has spent a lot of time studying this. He, he's, uh, uh, he has worked in Australia. He has worked in uh, United States for several years. And he's a venture capitalist now. And we are going to draw upon his wisdom and his memory of how things started. Sridhar ji, uh, where, where do we start, sir? I am going to start putting up the first graphic for our session today, which is the 70 plus year history of the People's Republic of China, starting from 1949. Right. I think thank you so much for uh, for that context and introduction. Also, uh, during my time in Asia uh, for over a decade and a half, uh, the opportunity to work in China uh, out of Hong Kong uh, by by being uh, by being in two large financial institutions in Asia, so some I have some close insights as uh, uh, as China built uh, built its empire as we call it uh, in a very strategic kind of a context, um, and you know it, it, nothing existed the 17 um, what they call as the uh, software exp uh, sorry um, uh, trade ex trade uh, promotion zones were set up in the uh, around the china sea uh, then extending itself into into today you know what we call a south china sea so i think that uh, i'll share some perspective i also had the uh, pleasure of working with uh, uh, mr hu jintao and uh, Ziang zemin um, of course i uh, left you uh, asia and united states when uh, mr wen jibao as well as uh, mr xi jinping uh, took over the affairs of china but by being in institutions here uh, in the United States, uh, we've always had uh, an eye on China. Uh, our own kind of uh, uh, funds, we do uh, have people from uh, China uh, working for us as well. Uh, so I think there is uh, a very good uh, context here. And China has uh, risen uh, in a very systematic architecture. Today, I think they are in, in one way, you call it as the fifth generation uh, since 1979 or 1949, 70 years or their uh, every plenium uh, uh, P, uh, uh, CPP communist uh, party uh, conferences, they lay out the strategic plan. So the most recent one was uh, earlier this year. So where do we go from here? The 70 year map, uh, I think, which uh, 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 Sri Ji has uh, presented uh, or shared uh, lays out the, uh, the perspective. What we want to present today is China today is and it clearly, the uh, on a uh, you know it's on a it's on a rise within the next three years. It will overtake United States uh, as the largest in PPP terms, uh, as well as very soon on a in a nominal GDP, it will bypass uh, United States to become the world's number one. Now, whenever you have uh, you know in 2000, it entered the WTO. Uh, and it has now been in the last uh, 15 years or so, it has been part of uh, various um, what you call as the economic uh, partnerships that has emerged uh, in uh, particularly in the Pacific and the Asian region. We had a separate discussion on this topic around the RCEP, uh, CPTPP, etc. So with it, um, with the rise of China as an economic power, uh, you know, one expected uh, a tremendous amount of uh, sense of responsibility and accountability. But on the contrary, what, has, what one has witnessed is a rise of China, under spe specifically around Xi Jinping leadership, what we are seeing now is a much more belligerent uh, China and where it is trying to exert its will either through persuasion or through force. Uh, there's no other uh, subtle or 
um, or explicit. Okay, if South China Sea is an example of explicit, if the Tibetan and the Himalayan region is uh, is is is, an, is another example of explicit exertion of power, uh, then you see the subtleties of it by virtue of its presence or footprint via media, their internal uh, ambassadors in various countries, the influence that it exerts through think tanks, um, as well as uh, its footprint in the educational institutions. So it has been wide, and, um, and we'll touch on that in the, uh, in the 70-year anniversary headlines, which comes later in our discussion. But this is just broadly the kind of the context and one of the biggest challenges that uh, the world is going to face, more specifically Asia is going to face, is how you coexist and work with China on various fronts. Very specifically, trade, energy, security, and harmony. Even as we speak about this program, I can tell you, sir, that there will be at least three different people of Chinese origin listening to this video broadcast to try and make sense of what we are saying, read between the lines and so on and so forth. Bring it on. That is fine. Sir, let us take a look first at the South China Sea. What right. China has been doing in the South China Sea, sir? I am going putting up the graphic for South China Sea. Please take it away. Well, I think that we have tried to share uh, what we call as uh, two charts. You know, one is what's the South China Sea area. So I'm assuming that you're uh, putting up the chart which has the Hainan, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, you know, the Malaysia, Brunei. So which is typically the yes, uh, yes. Is, is, is the confluence uh, of the conflict, right? Once you go into, below, into Malaysia, uh, into that area, then you get into the Malacca Straits. Uh, which then, you know, leads its way into the Indian Ocean. So you have, you know, in a strategic context, this particular region uh, is the flashpoint, yes, the yes. hot point uh, of the first format of dispute. Before we go in, before I kind of transition, one other point that I wanted to kind of uh, put things in perspective. Historically, China faced inwards. Vast part of its PLA, which is the army faced inwards, as it tried to unite the various regions, and basically being the communist power and command and control being run from a single monolithic structure from Beijing, the whole objective was to make sure that there were, there were no internal tremors coming from dissent and other things. So historically, the PLA faced inwards as it tried to you know, unify uh, and, and build a unified architecture commencing somewhere from 1979, right? It's mostly you know, around pre-2000, um, uh, especially around the reunification of Hong Kong and Macau, now you began to see stuff more moving outward. Of course, the India-China dispute or India-China issues is historical as similar to India-Japan, sorry, China-Japan, China-Korea, and then of course one China-China-Taiwan uh, issues. These are very historical and they have uh, spanned or spawned this time. So why, why is South China Sea, um, uh, you know, there is a dispute between, if you can put the next map up. We call it the nine, nine dash line. This nine dash line lays down an artificial kind of boundary or maritime boundary, which was agreed to between various parties, you now Philippines and China, China and Vietnam. Uh, China and Indonesia, China and even Malaysia. So, yes, sir, the, the second map of South China Sea is up. I just wanted to confirm to you. It just took me a, a second more than you said to get it up. But please continue, sir. OK, so the nine dash line is the uh, is the kind of the seamless maritime boundary line. So people can come in, you know, their trawlers, their fishing vessels, everything can come in. People can build their own security naval apparatus around the specific region uh, within, you know, for following those boundaries. And then what happened is that this was uh, breached and there has been persistent trouble around this specific region. And one of the first things that happened was the, uh, the Philippine-China um, um, uh, dispute which went into the International Court of Justice. Why this area is, is the flashpoint, 
I think we have discussed this. It is the uh, the world's kind of geolocation for largest pool of crude, largest uh, you know uh, uh, repository of natural gas. It is uh, represents roughly 66 percent of the global trade, and it also also represents uh, one of the key strategic maritime navigation points for China in terms of meeting. It's both energy, internal, uh, uh, domestic import, as well as the export uh, that it tries to funnel its way into the rest of the world. So it's a strategic point, but it has been contesting many of these islands. Indonesia, people say that it arrests people, it affects uh, the fisheries. Philippines, it affects their maritime security. Though there have been um, uh, occasions, there have been times that uh, China has tried to work on a bilateral basis between various countries, um, you find that this is one of the biggest flashpoints um, that that we have seen um, in the in the in their global kind of conflict. We'll take human rights as a separate as a separate topic. We'll first cover the uh, the issues around uh, the border disputes, the trade disputes, uh, and the maritime disputes. Um, that has been the centerpiece of uh, the specific focus. So you have. Uh, you know, this, uh, these two kind of maps depicting to you uh, one of the fla first flashpoints. And now today, in more recent times, the Quad has been formed because China, unnecessarily Australia has also been, especially in the uh, upper north, northern part of Australia, which is the Pacific Indian Ocean intersection, you find a Pacific intersection, you find that Australia as well has now been uh, brought into this specific conflict. So you have uh, today that uh, Quad, which is the quadrilateral uh, states of Japan, Australia, uh, United States, and India taking an active pursuit as an alternate to whatever the ASEAN countries have done or whatever the South China Sea nations have done uh, to protect their maritime boundaries. So the Quad in the last five years, the uh, last four years under President Trump's leadership and with Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Modi, uh, as well as Mr. Abe, Shinzo Abe, uh, you know, it has taken, and then of course, Scott Morrison of Australia, um, you have seen, um, you know, even maritime uh, wartime exercises and, uh, and more deterrence and there's another map which we can put, but we can run, we'll run short, but we will try to share it. If you see on the right-hand side, when you face your screen, right-hand side, uh, there's a Strotley Islands map just adjacent to the word China. Uh, the more, it's, it's like a, a, a quadrilateral. Um, where China has built uh, in the Strotley Island, China has built a huge naval, it's an artificial kind of a, an island with a um, uh, you know, seabed, and they have built a huge naval infrastructure uh, in this in this area. This is not a defense. This is basically a strategic type of an offense architecture. Uh, and probably the defense experts could, you know, analyze and give far more details than myself. But you have pretty much everything from, um, you know, submarines to ships to uh, the, uh, the the aircraft carriers. Um, you know, is 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 present along with um, a limited footprint of the foot soldiers or the PLA army in these islands. These things happened between somewhere between 2008 to 2016, and today it is a sprawling kind of an infrastructure. There is no mechanism to, uh, you know, unless there is a very dirty war, uh, there is no way by which this infrastructure is going to be untangled. How the world is going to deal with it, why, should China take an offensive position, uh, is uh, remains a big question mark. And um, something that should have been a deterrence, but it is not. It is. It was not the case. And you know, the world has to confront uh, the, the 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 Chinese footprint right in the center of the South China Sea. So moving from uh, South China to the next flashpoint, which is not yet a flashpoint, is Djibouti. Djibouti, pretty much everybody has right in the African, uh, you know, the Mediterranean uh, area. You have. Pretty much everybody there, right? Which is namely, you have the United States, you have the French, uh, you have uh, even India has now got uh, a small base. But what China has built in this 
uh, area is begs the question to many people. Apparently, they have got this. It's almost like a multi-tier building of naval architecture and multi-tier building where you have, you know, vessels, you have, um, you know, um, forces with ground forces capability with mobile with um, uh, what you call, you know, tanks and armored carriers and, you know, there's a vast amount of infrastructure that they have built. Plus, also, it's like a fortress. So you can't kind of that with with its own deterrence in 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 uh, uh, anybody trying to encroach um, and uh, you know attack the facilities in Djibouti. The question that is being asked in the in the Horn of Africa, uh, which is also why the Horn of Africa, it is the access and passage, strategic passage uh, into the broader African continent for trade. It's also access into, you know, Africa is also uh, 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 an energy oil producer, uh, you know, some of the African nations, leading with Nigeria. So therefore, it's also an access into the, uh, the energy resources in Africa. Then you have, um, is also, you know, uh, access to the food. They produce a lot of um, agro products in the African region. It is also the area where there is maximum amount of pirates, you know, from Somalian pirates to the others, you also have the pirates creating a humongous menace in that region. So people kind of say, you know, you have a footprint basically to, to manage uh, um, uh, this aspect of it. But it has become again another flashpoint, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, yeah. Sir, um, I have the Djibouti map all correctly done. My, my only question, sir, is how is it that the Somali pirates never seem to attack any Chinese vessel? Well, I think that, uh, well, I think that what it also points out is that Chinese are far more decisive and ruthless in dispensing with anybody who encroaches upon them. Um, now, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, there have been, China doesn't, China doesn't comply with rules of game with anyone. China has only one set of rules, that is Chinese rules, right? It lays down its rules and it imposes and enforces and acts according to those rules. Doesn't matter which part of the world, including in the United States, okay? Including the most developed or the most sophisticated nation in the world, it basically you know, uses only one set of principles, which is its policy and its principles, okay? So South China Sea is an example. What is to come in the Horn of Africa is exactly similar to what is going to happen in the South China Sea, right? It's already, you can see, when we look at the Indian Ocean, they are trying to get there. So, but at least India seems to be, India and United States and Japan seems to be a little bit ahead of the game. There's some kind of, you know, if they do something in Hamban Kota in Sri Lanka, then our fellows uh, Indians are doing something in Maldives uh, with the Maldivian government. And then, you know, then you have, uh, um, uh, uh, you have the uh, Andaman Nicobar uh, uh, basis uh, as well in, in that specific region. So you have at least some semblance uh, of uh, deterrence in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and mind you, 7th Fleet, which is uh, Yokosuko, can con come only up to uh, the India-Pakistan kind of the geographical borders. So you really need another footprint uh, for it to move. So this concept of the 1st Fleet that they've been talking about and the concept of Australia being engaged is to make sure that there is a secondary deterrence which is much more proximus. One of the ports that is being considered is Singapore as a port as a location in consort with um, in India. Now, India, India's submarines are, um, you know, not, I mean, India doesn't have a huge submarine fleet. Uh, India has uh, deployed its uh, naval architecture, but for it to be expansive in its scope, you need support uh, of, of United States and to some extent, Australia in the Indian Ocean. So therefore, the um, Indian Ocean is still to be resolved unlike the Horn of Africa or unlike the South China Sea, which is the two major uh, flashpoints right now of the South China Sea, South China Sea Pacific uh, are the biggest ones in terms of the entanglement with the Chinese as you kind of look at orchestrating and organizing yourself on the, um, on the maritime boundary as well as maritime trade. 
So, sir, next, let's take a quick look at what is happening in the line of actual control, the Himalayan region, the conflict between India and China. I'm going to put up the map now, sir. So I will let you know when the map is up and it is up now. Great. Sri, I think, you know, you can also chip into uh, this part. This is something that's of, uh, you know, proximus to an the Himalayan as well. region, the uh, conflict you know, you between can divide India this and China. The I'm going to put up the map well now, sir. So, right? so the western side, you, know when the map is you up, have the Gilgit and Baltistan, which now. is where, through that uh, passes the, the, what we call the CPEC. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. When you actually look at it, that's very much part of the one unified Jammu and Kashmir, which India India claims legitimate sovereign rights over Gilgit Baltistan, and you have the you have uh, basically issues around that. Then you have the Akshay Chin, which has been occupied, which is the most kind of contentious region as you move from west towards uh, the east. Um, uh, then you have uh, northeast, and then you have the I issues around yes. If I could just add, sir, uh, in P Gurus and personally when I'm on TV hangouts, I like to refer to Aksai Chin by its original name, which is Ghost Thana. Just wanted to let you know. Please continue, sir. Sure, sure. Um, thank you. So I think you need to think uh, along the strategic lines of why China. Uh, if I could just add, you know, sir, uh, in P Gurus and personally when I'm on TV hangouts, I like China to refer to. Aksai Chin by its original name, which is Indian Ghost Ocean, Kana. Just wanted to let you know, please continue, sir. the Horn of Africa is about trade, is about energy, is about geosecurity for its aspirational desires. The Himalayan region is about water, largest concentration of water systems are located in the Himalayan region. The ecosystem, because you have the largest mountainous ranges with snow. So one can basically impose a threat on the water side by, by effectively imposing your will, because the China controls the upper terrains of the river system, whereas countries like India and so on are in the, in the lower terrains of the, the, the river systems. Then you have the third, which is environment. The lot of seismic environmental activity is managed and observed from this particular region. As part of the one Tibet policy, China one, I mean China one Tibet policy by United States, United States put four demands. One is it wanted to have an embassy, so it acts as an independent arbitrator between the Tibetans and the Chinese, um, especially the selection of Dalai Lama and preserving freedom and so on. Then you have the second. It wanted to have a kind of monitoring role in the environmental aspect. That is the number two. And then you have the third, which is effectively to make sure that the region has adequate amount of support from a resources point of view, especially the Tibetans. And fourth is obviously the, the river systems, to make sure that the river systems is not used as a threat. So China, usually the United States as the, as the superpower in the absence of Russia uh, has been. So this whole thing around the Himalayan kingdom, from a Chinese point of view, is around these four factors. No Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama will come from China will not be will be appointed by just like everything else is appointed from China will be appointed by China river systems it wants to control the river systems you can see now that they are building in the uh, uh, the upper Arunachal Pradesh region they're trying to build a huge dam and then India has objected to it on Brahmaputra uh, what we call Brahmaputra in India and basically uh, using and you know they are building uh, a deterrence around that in the lower in the lower terrain. So the river systems um, is, 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 is another kind of a big, big issue for, for especially in uh, the Indo-Chinese kind of uh, ecosystem dispute. The, I think the other thing that is being, which is the whole northeastern region, uh, you know, the Sikkim, uh, the uh, Bhutan, 
what they call as the Chinese net. Uh, then the passage into uh, the eastern, eastern belt. That basically intersects with the India Look East strategy, you know, as it goes, um, you know, as, as India makes its way from uh, its eastern borders into, uh, into Myanmar, into um, uh, Cambodia, into Vietnam, and all the way into Thailand. And then with the islands, it can go into crossing the islands, it can go into Indonesia. So it's a very broad Look East strategy that Modi is aspiring. And it's also the population, one of the largest um, concentrated populations in that particular region between Vietnam and Indonesia. You are talking about close to 400 million people, 400 to 500 million people, um, of which 200 million just in Indonesia alone, roughly 89 million in Vietnam or 85 plus million in, uh, in Vietnam. Then you had Cambodia, Laos uh, and Thailand. So it is a, um, I'm not putting up uh, a GDP map, but if you take a look at the GDP map, 52% of the GDP comes from that specific kind of a region. If you take a look at the map at 2030 on the on the GDP side, you will find many of these countries will constitute uh, the dominating the top 10 economies of the world. And 52% out of the 52%, 71% of that share will be between India and China. And 52% of that will be uh, the Chinese. So therefore, from an economic context, and as well as from the context of the Himalayan region from an ecosystem. So there is a strategic map that they have in their mind. If we control this, that means we just suppress anything that comes. The only person who can potentially be a deterrent is India, right? You take India out and you break the barrier, then you have a seamless passage around the entire Upper East going all the way. Then you have on the sea, you have already the South China Sea, with the Spratly Islands acting as the strategic center outside the mainland China. Then you go further up, then you have the Senkaku Islands, which is another flashpoint dispute between United, between Japan and China. So that's another intersection uh, where they can kind of throttle the Japanese, um, primarily the fishermen. It's basically around, because China imports a tremendous amount of its, in, its food. It is reliant on these nations, which is where all these fisheries and the seafood, um, um, uh, what you call uh, zones are located. So I think when you take a look, so the Himalayan kingdom and the Eastern strategy is land as well as the environment and the ecosystem. And the South China Sea is about the entire maritime. And I connected the Djibouti because it takes you into future as well, because the most recent we have covered, Japan is looking at East Africa following India's strategy of uh, East Africa as one of the biggest kind of trading partners. So right at the epicenter is the issue of China confronting both the maritime as well as the on-ground ecosystem. So everywhere you create conflicts and you interfere and you try to then therefore soften those nations and even until they kind of eventually surrender. Thank you, sir. I just put up the second map of the India, China, Himalayan region, where we show what was the claim of the Kingdom of Jammu and Kashmir up until 1947. If you look at that map, it goes further into what is the modern day Tibet, isn't it? So I just yeah. wanted you to uh, dwell on it for just a minute. Well, I think that Tibet is, uh, I think we, we touched a little bit, Tibet has become Tibet is, Tibet is uh, uh, the emotional part of Tibet. It is, it is, it is a very large region. It is control. It is, it is the controlling access to many rivers. Uh, it is also a flourishing religion called Buddhism. The root of the Buddhism is, um, you know, uh, today the Dalai Lama comes from Tibet. It has a largest constituent base um, around the world, the Tibetan Buddhism. It has followers everywhere. So China has, why Tibet? Tibet is also a mechanism to make sure that there is no external pressure influenced, external pressure imposed by the overseas Tibetans who have very influential followers and who have influential people of power 
who can create potential problems for China, right? So the Tibetan annexation was around the extension, plus also the Tibet gives it a much quicker land-based, I think they're going to now build a railroad going all the way uh, to from Jiangjing province to all the way to um, somewhere upper uh, Arunachal Pradesh region. And that will cut the travel time from 23 hours to about 11 or 12 hours, and then easy conduit from there into the Eastern Passage. So the whole thing is around how you can bridge this huge landmass, which is economically important, which is strategically important, which is militarily important, which is environmentally important, but it's also important on the trade side as a passage. So these constant flashpoints, right, around, that's why they try to do a deal with Nepal, Nepal, and they try to influence the political administration there. They try to grab territory in Nepal. They try to then impose a will by to say that any Tibetan who is oppressed and trying to cross the border, you know, should be dispensed in a most ruthless manner or should be handed over to the PLA. So the whole thing is around a mechanism to impose, impose its will at any cost with one rule policy. There is no arbitration. Nobody wants to arbitrate. Nobody wants to deal with some of these issues. You know, we'll get to that, you know, when we talk about some of the issues that, that uh, China is, uh, you know, confronting. So you have uh, they have got the uh, navigation on the uh, maritime. They have got the passage on the eastern side. They've got the access into Africa. So now we go into the next one. Sir, um, before we go to the next one, I just want you to dwell a little bit upon what happened between Bhutan and Israel. Well, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And the world media kind of, you know, bypassed it. Again, thanks to United States, thanks to India. So... Amongst all the countries, Israel has struck a strategic partnership with Bhutan. <coughs> two reasons, there are two essential reasons. One, Israel is considered as one of the, the most advanced countries in irrigation system. You know, can, you know they can, they, they produce, they can produce crops in the desert. So therefore, I think that they are forming this partnership basically to help the Bhutanese, because agriculture is a significant part of their life, so to improve uh, the agro facilities, especially around the winters, as well as in some of the barren land, and, and also in case they're impacted by any of the river systems, so Israel, that's the first. But far more important within the context is why do I say it is not number one? But that's not the thing. If Bhutanese want to be, they don't like war, they you know, basically love peace. But at the same time, there is this constant threat that is looming. And with their understanding with India, they have been able to deter the Chinese. The Chinese threat is real. So they are not equipped with the best intelligence capabilities and drones and those types of infrastructure. So we may see Israel playing a significant part in enabling by working very closely with United States and India, which is right there in, uh, I have a feeling we may see even the French under Macron, Emmanuel Macron, you may see French also playing a part in that specific kind of the region where you have a map which shows, you know, Indian map, Nepal, Bhutan, you know, the specific, that specific region we may see um, uh, in an important kind of activity with Israel getting involved. And viewers, one of the things that you should keep in mind is that there is also active interference on part of China or interests aligned with the Chinese to try and suppress information that might be seen as being adversarial to China. For example, how many of you knew that Israel and Bhutan have gotten into this new relationship. So these are some of the things that we are up against. That is one of the reasons why P Gurus is a place where you can get facts. And, and I'm, I'm not beating my own drum. We have some technical challenges, but we are overcoming them. But just keep in mind that we have a lot of interest in telling you the truth. 
truth but nothing nothing but the truth sir let's take on uh, the look uh, take a look at the bri initiative now and i'm now putting up that screen sir so please take it away right thank you okay so we come to the um, uh, uh, you know the final flash point um, conceived in 2013 uh, that china felt it's um, you know its export market is pretty much saturated um, in the traditional model with united states being one of the largest bilateral trading partners so the question therefore became how does it now connect and create an infrastructure going deep into the nations you cannot do it you can only go ports or naval ports or you can go into airports as the two mechanisms of trade so the third one which is land which will which will reach into the infrastructure deep of many countries how do you do it and it gives three opportunities for china one to put the money that it has close to 3 trillion to use by building the infrastructure so it, it called belt road belt and road initiative as infrastructure to augment the internal capabilities of the nations if you are looking at the slide the slide will basically show to you um, you know the route of the bri right so it connects europe it covers the asiatic republics it covers the central asia then it covers southeast asia it covers the indian ocean islands it also touches um right at the top the mediterranean sea so therefore pretty much you know you have covered the world through a what you call a land and sea type of a map right and you know germany is uh, if you you know around the uh, the port of um, um germany has given access uh, through dusseldorf uh, to you know inward and now they are regretting as to why they gave because you're going to find the cars and other stuff which is manufactured in china seamlessly making its way right uh, right through the country so the the point about the belt road initiative is i said three things infrastructure the second is you can lend basically deploy the capital and this is one of the things that is clouded as draconian debt trap based interest rates which china denies okay so second is it puts the capital to use third it now is able to go deep and supply into the mainstream population rather than through controlling the supply into these nations for example mongolia doesn't have a port for example russia go to go deep into russia to go deep into central asia you need the land infrastructure right this is where this big dispute that happens around the iran you know the gadar port versus the uh, uh, jabahar jabahar port you know gadar in pakistan and uh, jabahar in uh, iran so these ports are the conduits to go into you know mainstream land so belt road initiative is an answer to that specific program <clears throat> which initially everybody embraced united states and india became the two nations to effectively stand against uh, not withstanding the fact us is not directly involved in bri europe is involved in the bri india has steadfastly opposed uh, the bri efforts so when you kind of take a look at the whole um, the trade uh, and the security you find every facet like be it sea be it land uh, be it this new only ground based infrastructure china is on a confrontational kind of a path this resulted in the first kind of dispute being filed and in the icj in the international court of justice and the icj surprise surprise the icj ruling went against china and in 2016 and philippines was won the the sovereignty and the maritime yeah so before we go to the uh, icj dispute i just wanted to uh, show something to our viewers in the map you just saw um you see that uh, the this is one of the renderings by the way there were many in this rendering it goes right across india 
and and I think then they have changed it now, wherein it just goes and touches Kolkata and goes along the maritime line. I just wanted to tell our viewers that this is one of the grand plans of China. They want to split India into two. Now start putting things in perspective as to why this farmers uh, agitation is happening. And also, I don't know how many of you have read my post today about what is being hatched next in the farmers agitation. We have a lot of interesting things coming out, but be that as it may, I just wanted to kind of- uh, That's a great point, great point, it's a great point. Uh, just to keep, please, if you can keep the graph, Yes, yes, it's still look, there. The Look East strategy, the Look East strategy, if you want to look at that map that you're, that, uh, uh, that you're probably seeing right now, is look at that red arrow going from West Asia to South Asia. Yes. And from South Asia to Southeast Asia. That South Asia to Southeast Asia is the, exactly the infrastructure what each India has built. The infrastructure has been built by India. It is a road that connects all the way from Indian eastern border to all the way to right now up to Thailand. And it can stretch its way into Indonesia. And you can see the arrow extending further up into uh, the Indonesian islands. Yes, right. yes, yes, absolutely. Right, so that is the, uh, uh, that's the map. And then you can see close below that is the blue which is the South China Sea and moving into the Indian Ocean. And then you have into, into the Horn and moving into uh, Mediterranean. So therefore, it's a very integrated strategy through their plenium, plenarium uh, conferences. They very clearly build out an architectural strategy and they maniacally execute against it. This BRI is the latest one formulated in 2013. It has had its ups and downs, but these guys plan 20, 30 years. They do not plan for four years or five years, and they just go on and on and on and on, okay, uh, at it. And again, that uh, uh, the, the light blue and the slightly darker blue, uh, which is the Indian Ocean to South China to South Pacific, yes. that's where you have this uh, TPP, um, RCEP, RCEP, uh, and then the broad, uh, the the broader tra uh, trade Indo-Pacific uh, trade strategy. So this is the whole kind of orchestration as to why they need to be. Now, when we actually put up another map, which is to say, with Ch with, with whom China has bilateral relationships, with whom India has bilateral, with J with whom Japan has bilateral. We did that to some extent in the RCEP presentation, but yes. we presented it within the context of why it is not relevant to India, why it is not significant as an initiative, though China wants to tout it as a big kind of an accomplishment. But what we are seeing is what we are presenting here today is all the flashpoints, which has no resolution mechanism. The point is there is no resolution. The literature and the academic pundits will say Oh, it follows these guidelines, it has formed these norms, it has not this. Doesn't matter whether it's a WTO norm, whether uh, we just mentioned the ICJ norm, whether it is the um, any kind of maritime boundary disputes. China has never complied with any and nothing has been enforced. Even, even within China, international organizations which have a footprint, they are not able to take any arbitration from inside China to outside. People are persecuted and executed per the Chinese laws within. And the world has taken a blind, benign, blind eye and accepted this, and even without sanctions. There's no sanctions. Only person who has put some sanctions on China and who has restricted is President Trump. Uh, is likely to lose the elections if things don't go his way. Yeah, sorry. Sir, we should also uh, mention uh, Narendra Modi because he had the guts and the gall to, uh, I won't say gall, the guts to ban so many Chinese apps which were mining Indian population's data using their artificial engine, intelligence engines to try and map out every person in this world is being mapped. You are a number, you are a statistic, you are somebody in the Chinese database where they are trying to figure out 
how do I make this person make me uh, sing my praises? I'm just uh, maybe uh, uh, exaggerating a bit, but I want to also mention that Narendra Modi had the guts to stop. I think 118 apps now of Chinese origin do not have any place in uh, in India today. I just thought I'll add that, sir. So um, let's. Uh, would you like? Since you brought this up, yes. I think it was India which showed the world that the Chinese can be looked at eye to eye and, you know, the armies can face each other. They have done it twice. One is Doklam. The Doklam was an eye-opener which told the world that the Chinese can be, can be contained. The second is the most um, uh, recent, recent. Uh, skirmishes in, uh, in Ladakh. And, they are, uh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, there's still some co uh, co contention, which I think you are a subject matter expert in this, which is whether they are inside uh, India by how many miles and how many kilometers uh, and how many of them. Uh, uh, but still, there seems to be uh, India is in no position. India is not relenting. And India is saying that it is holding its status quo. So, yes, sorry uh, if I didn't express that. But clearly, the uh, Modi-China uh, confrontation uh, also basically showed the world, which is where I Modi emerged as a strong leader of the world, where he's able to defend the sovereignty of his nation and defend the right, defend the rights of the people, right? So therefore, and you can see, as you rightly pointed out, uh, their subtle threats that we talked about, not explicit, through their surrogates uh, and many of these agitations and points and that kind of stuff going on. The same thing in United States. We had Secretary Pompeo making a statement that the Chinese are here in the industry and the Chinese are here in Wall Street. Well, we have also given them access. We are hearing that we have given them access for money into our educational institutions. You know, he uses the very strong words to steal our technologies, to steal our ideas, to steal our innovation and to influence the thinking of uh, around the China policy. So it is time that we look at it as a national security issue rather than a mere passage for the sake of sponsored education in our universities. This is in his Georgetown address. Uh, this is most recently in uh, Georgia Tech. And he was also in Georgetown University where he met, uh, made a similar uh, kind of, uh, of an address. So therefore, I think to your point, yes, um, you have these subtle pressures and I think Modiji did a lot of things around the applications and the banning of those applications. And uh, viewers, I might also point out that India lost the Depsang area, again in the Ladakh region, as way back as in 2010, 2010. Who was the Home Minister then? Mr. P. Chadambaram, who thinks nothing about giving opinion on everything under the sun. Nobody has the guts to ask him some questions. Today, I'm asking these questions. What the heck were you doing? when uh, China was occupying a territory. And what did your great leader, Mr. Rahul Gandhi, sign in 2008? Why are you hiding that? Who are, what are you trying to hide there? So the point here is that Depsang has been lost to India since 2010, and many people are trying to hang it on Modi, which, which I don't think it is fair. I may have some disagreements with the way the Modi government works. That is all fine, but we have to say where the truth lies. In 2010, India lost the Depsang area, which I don't know if they are going to try and recover back in these talks that are going on. We'll have to wait and see. Sir, let us take a quick look at India, uh, uh, China's uh, compliance or lack thereof of the uh, International Court of Justice rulings. That is what I'm putting up now. So uh, here we go. Take it away, sir. Yeah, okay. So I think basically uh, China rejects the territorial claims. Uh, it says that, uh, uh, you know, it's not going to accept uh, the border area between uh, Parasal Islands and Scarborough Islands and Spratly Islands. I told you we mentioned that Spratly Islands has become a big kind of Chinese strategic naval base. Um, that's going to be a big problem in the South China Sea for the world. The only mechanisms that you see is the deterrence. Now, what uh, China says is that you know, I, uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'm, it's disappointed and it will not agree uh, by the ICJ ruling. What is the world's response? The response is, it says that China says, you know, United States has had similar kind of violations going back to 1984. So United States has not complied with it. So therefore, I'm not going to comply with it. Tell me what you're going to do about it. 
Okay, are we going to have a confrontation? So therefore, I think the ICJ ruling has become an inflection point in terms of the inability of the world to address. So the only way that they are going to uh, to, to deal with this issue is what uh, Mr. Ajit Doval calls as, you know, uh, offensive, uh, defensive offense, which is they're going to kind of have all these, you know, naval vessels and submarines and, uh, uh, you know, Air Force carriers, uh, um, uh, carriers. So they're going to have all these vessels, drones in China. I mean, Taiwan has been given drones, more advanced drones, armed, unarmed drones. Um, and, you know, armed, unarmed vehicles. So you're going to see a whole sprawling infrastructure of armed resources, each kind of, you know, um, acting as a deterrence to the other. That's the only model. The 2016 model proves the theory that China will not be compliant, be it to the South China, be it to the Himalayan Kingdom, be it to the Eastern and be it to the Belt Road Initiative. So most recently, uh, in the um, in the uh, uh, Shanghai Cooperation um, Organization (SCO), India outrightly rejected the PRI initiative. It, it laid down three reasons: one, the CPEC passes through Balti uh, Gilgit Baltistan, which is the sovereign state of uh, uh, of India. Number one. Number two, nowhere in the world. China's policies has been fair. It only tilts one way. It, consist, it is consistent with the policy that Ch India took on the RCEP. So it basically rejects on the second ground, which is to say there is no fairness. I, it, they use the word unevenness in the, uh, in the definition of the, the trade policy. The third, it has pointed out there are no dispute mechanisms. There are absolutely no dispute mechanisms. You can see the kind of the dispute resolution process, even for the armed conflicts, and the sovereign boundary conflicts that India and China have experienced in most recent times. You go on meeting and meeting and meeting. Then you say you have independent observers. Then you withdraw so much, you withdraw so much. No, you never withdraw. You pretend you withdraw, you stay there while you're doing, you're building your reinforcements. So to me, the Belt Road Initiative, it probably will happen. But the first thing that we pointed out in Belt Road, the cost, if people don't repay those loans, that draconian interest rates, which starts around 6%, goes up to 10 to 12%, you know, are upwards, whatever the norms are. And China denies what these rates are. But many of the countries who have incurred these loans uh, have come out and stated this, could become one of the biggest kind of deterrents in terms of getting any of these things off the ground. Having said that, China has what you call multiple self-deterrence kind of mechanisms, like land, road, air, uh, indirect, direct control. India was fortunate under Mr. Modi ji to make sure that in its internal artisans and internal crafts and internal handicrafts and its heritage value, um, whatever you want to call it, you know, idols, dolls, um, you know, various kinds of artifacts are all made by local people in the process it is preserved rather than kind of made in uh, China effort, which was the way it was going. That's the way it is. I mean, that is the way you see it in the United States as well, uh, in many parts of the world. So the story is that, you know, you do not want to make, you, uh, you, you don't want to become submerged and submissive to every facet to the point that the entire heritage value, that's something that we have not touched. Tibet is about heritage. Bhutan is about heritage. India is also about heritage, right? And so, therefore, they do not want to see that the heritage aspect of it is not kind of obliterated in the process of... Uh, it's very interesting that uh, one of the people in yesterday's rally, yesterday's rally, Trump rally, there was a massive Trump rally. This is today, Sunday in the United States, yesterday, sun, Saturday in D.C. Some of the ladies pointed out that today in education in the United States... They're formally saying liberalism is good, communism is good, socialism is good. So he's saying my children are coming and telling me in education, this is good. If that is good, then why are we doing capitalism in this part of the world? Why are we doing free market? Why are we following the three essential principles that is enshrined in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, democ in the, in the sovereign constitution of the nation? So 
you are beginning to see these types of influences, which I called as subtle, uh, creeping into the ecosystem. So I think that there's much more, much more at game than, than just purely the trade. And none of these disputes or none of this, what you call as conflicting issues, have no mechanism to kind of enforce. If we kind of go to the next slide, which is the 70 years of China rule, which started from post opening from 1949, when it became one federation to 2019, if one reads the policy that was enacted at that point of time under Xi Jinping, if people have not read it, it's time that people read it, it makes you sh really shudder and shiver in terms of what is the fault, what is the basis. I mean, it's not meant to be fear, to strike a fear, but just being aware of what it is, right? Which is to tighten the grip, that tighten the grip around the country and the world and tighten the grip on both government and non-government sectors of the, of, the, of, of the nation. How they would do it? They would find that they will have all sectors of society, including those who are internet activists, non-governmental organizations, those who have different ideologies, those who belong to different ethnic minorities, those who are in bureaucracy. So it will deploy massive technology resources to address technologies such as artificial intelligence, technologies such as biometrics, technologies such as big data into its arsenal and the word that is used is to monitor and shape the minds and behavior of 1.4 billion people. That's the kind of the construct. We just heard post the COVID situation in the most recent US election skirmishes. They have also now built a global DNA based database of the most influential people around the world, not just within the country, around the world. In fact, Last week, there was a press report. They've got this AI capability, which says that it will be able to not only detect a Uyghur Muslim, but also send an alert message and control to its internal, whatever, police and other organizations, etc., in terms of monitoring and managing these people. So therefore, I think that this effect of tightening control over its, as a formal kind of, I'm not suggesting it was not a formal policy, but this is this kind of uh, framework does raise a question around, you know, where is this going to start and where is this going to kind of end in the pursuit, in its pursuit of being the most powerful nation in the world. It may argue that in the Cold War between Russia versus US, all these kinds of things prevailed, spying prevailed widely. So therefore, China is today a very powerful, very soon will be the number one economy on the world. It needs to protect. It's not a democracy. Uh, it is what they, whatever you want to call it. It is a single control, uh, a social monolithic power, and it needs to have in its arsenal the capabilities that helps it to manage and navigate its pursuit of being what it wants to be. Thank you so much, uh, Sridhar ji. We are about uh, an hour and a uh, few minutes uh, into the program thus far. Um, one of the questions that I had, sir, is we don't know which administration is going to be in place in January 20th, but chances are that it's going to be a Biden administration. And if we look at some of the things that happened in Spratly Islands, for example, it happened under the watch of the Democrats when Obama was the president and Joe Biden was the vice president. So can we expect a different approach now that Biden has become president from what Obama did? Many people forget that, uh, you know, the, the, the Obama is sound like, oh, he's the greatest president ever to have ruled the uh, 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 United States. A lot of things are now coming out. Benghazi, uh, you know, flying M uh, planes without any ammunition across China and then allowing Russia to annex Crimea and then all this Spratly Island stuff. When India, when 
when Obama could have stepped in, when the U.S. could have stepped in and stopped this Spratly Island growth of these uh, naval bases, today you wouldn't be sitting lo looking at the situation. Now, everybody is suddenly woken up to the fact that China has its arms around just about everyone. In fact, I don't know how many of the viewers saw our hangout on Friday where we talked about the Chinese spy connection, honey trap, and, and God knows how many people were caught in that. We don't know how many people... How many of them are dancing to the tunes of the Chinese? We have no idea. So I just want you to kind of map out for us today if uh, you know Biden is going to come to uh, on his first day of uh, you know his presidency, what are the immediate things he needs to start doing? Well, I think that the uh, it is considered and it is believed that um, Obama, uh, Biden will be far more um, sympathetic, but at the same time, all the messages that are coming out is that uh, the China policy will not change. Uh, Biden would be uh, would be forceful and preserving uh, preserving the U.S. Uh, interests. And and then when you look at the administration, uh, Anthony Franken, when you look at the administration, it really does not inspire you to assume that. There would be anything that is different uh, to what was there before under the democratic administrations. There's no mechanism unless and until the U.S. armed forces or U.S. defense apparatus is given a complete freedom to work with the quadrilateral nations. And in fact, Richard Armitage and one other person um, I forget the name of the second person in his policy as to what would be pursued, what could be pursued. Richard is, uh, you know, comes from the Obama time. They don't talk about what. They only talk about going back to uh, TPP and or now CPTPP, and they talk about the ASEAN re-engagement and the United States joining TPP and ASEAN. So that's, you know, that's the. Uh, um, you know, that's the discussion that is kind of uh, taking shape. So it doesn't kind of, I'm not, I'm not fatalistic, but I'm not suggesting that you're going to see some magic bullet coming out of the Biden. So what's the way forward? The way forward is going to be, already we discussed it in our daily briefs, Japan and Australia have formed a collaboration. Australia and India have formed a collaboration. Israel and Bhutan has formed a collaboration. India and Israel have a collaboration. India and Japan and India, Vietnam, India, Thailand, uh, India, Vietnam, India, Indonesia, uh, India, Taiwan have a collaboration. U.S., Taiwan, the, that thing, whether it will, they will soften or whether it will continue remains to be seen. So you are finding this, what you call as the bilateral kind of collaboration, maybe trilateral to some extent, will act as the pockets of deterrence. Nothing can be done. I think we discussed it about in my, you know, the last 20, 25 minutes, 30. There's nothing. It's done. It's horses left the stable. You can't bolt the door. You can bolt the door. Nothing. The horse is left. So therefore, I think there's nothing that can be done. <coughs> These efforts are well entrenched. The only incomplete part is the BRI. So BRI will stutter. And um, whereas the other uh, maritime and naval I think it's done deal. As, uh, I mean, for example, you mentioned Obama didn't blunder. Obama also blundered on the what you call uh, the red line. Okay, there was no red line. The red line is the red line is the red line, which is the Syrian chemical warfare, right, which they inflicted on their people. He also blundered in the Libyan struggle. He said, "We are not. We will be leading the world from behind." Those were the famous words, right? When the French and the Brits kind of went ahead and uh, took, out, took out Gaddafi and that whole kind of area, that Benghazi and so on. It's a complete mess that uh, uh, that will probably have its own kind of investigations. So even there, we were leading the world from behind. So the question, therefore, is why would you ask, why would anybody assume that there is going to be a sudden enlightenment and a far more offensive? Democrats have historically, historically been not offensive in their approach um, you know, in, in as far as defense matters are concerned. 
I think with a $4 trillion, that's the number that's being touted, with a $4 trillion stimulus, right, targeted at $450 billion to Paris Accord, re-establishing the world institutions such as WHO, United Nations, Human Rights Commission, and then putting another $85 million into uh, this, um, what you call, uh, or $100 million, I mean, Trump calls it as trillion dollars, but let's assume putting some $100 billion or $150 billion uh, into make these environmentally friendly buildings uh, that, you know, to, to retool these buildings. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, another $2 trillion going in to basically refund some of the programs, retooling the local administrations, retooling the local councils, and normalizing $12 million, 12 million illegal uh, refugees, there's no money. So there is no money. Four trillion is gone. So United States is going to, in my view, if this four trillion goes in as a stimulus with stringent measures, one of the least focused areas is going to be defense. So therefore, if I just use my economic and banking hat, I can see this being a strategic priority for the Biden administration and basically going to let the respective countries to deal and dispense with matters as they see appropriate from a sovereignty point of view. That's how I see it. Well, that was a fascinating um, discussion about what China has accomplished in the last 70 years. I don't think I have seen any other presentation that covered the width and the breadth and the depth that you have given to this uh, this topic sir thank you very much our viewers i'm sure when they see the video again they'll understand the amount of knowledge that uh, has uh, gone into this and the preparation that has gone into it sir one one small thing that i wanted to add viewers now you understand why these last two senate seats in georgia assume the kind of significance that we have been talking for the last few weeks that it is important that the Senate be controlled by the Republicans because if you don't have checks and balances, a vibrating, a vibrant democracy will not be possible and anybody can sort of run the slate and it will be too late before we realize the consequences of that. With that, thank you very much Sridharji. It was, uh, it was again, like I said, I'm out of words to describe the, the information that was exchanged here and we had a few technical difficulties in the beginning, like everything, software tends to fail when you least expect it to. But be that as it may, I believe that we have conveyed the best possible message on what China is up to and what the world needs to do. Thank you very much. Those of you who have watched this program, if you think that we added value to you, please request, we request you to subscribe to our channel and also to donate it. And by the way, no amount of donation would have fixed the problems that we had today while having the program live. This is, this is one of those things where there are so many things, moving parts and some things sometimes go wrong. But be that as it may, we will clean up this video and repost it on our channel with the glitches removed. Once again, thank you very much and Namaskar. Namaskar and thank you very much everybody.